All right. Well, good morning, you guys. Um, let's see. So I've told you so far about the magnitude and the direction of um, liquid crystal order, pneumatic order. Um, today, I want to go on to talk about how thinking about the direction leads you to considerations of uh, localized features, which are uh, topological defects or solitons in the director field. Okay, so um, you know my my quick non-mathematical description of topology right, is that it, it describes aspects of geometrical objects that are counted rather than measured. Right? So if you're looking at an object, you might measure that it has some length. Right? And the length can vary continuously. Right? You would get some funny number like this. Right? In computer science, we would say a floating point number. Um, Whereas, if you're counting, you might say an object has zero or one or two holes, right? And the, um, the result of a count is an integer rather than a floating point number, right? So this is important in lots of areas of physics, um, mainly because, you know, it, it deals with the question of um, what happens if you make small changes to an object, right? If you make some gradual continuous changes, then any measurement is going to change continuously, right? Whereas if you have a count that's stuck at an integer, then it'll stay the same integer, right? So it will be fixed, locked in at some value um, for a long time, right? Until you make some gigantic change to your object and then the integer could jump to another integer. Okay. So um, that makes topological features especially uh, robust. And so that is a significant thing in many areas of physics. Um, let me show you how it has consequences for liquid crystals. Okay. So um, I, I want to begin by telling you the story for a two-dimensional director field and then scale up to 3D. Okay. So for a two-dimensional director field, um, that means we have an N of R, okay, and the N is two-dimensional. Right? What I care about at the moment is the dimension of N, not the dimension of R. Okay. So N is going to be a two-dimensional unit vector and R uh, might be 1D or 2D or 3D for the position. Okay. So if N is a two-dimensional unit vector, right, it can be represented by an angle right, relative to some axis. Right? So cosine of theta and sine of theta, right, where theta is varying continuous. Uh, uh, where theta is, is an angle right, between uh, 0 and 2 pi. Uh, OK. So. Um, all right, so here, um, let's begin by supposing that we have uh, a two-dimensional pneumatic order that's a function of 1D, okay? So that makes a picture like this one, okay? And so um, let's suppose we have boundary conditions, like boundary conditions that I talked about yesterday. Okay, where, where at the minimum, at x min, um, the director has to be vertical. And at x max, the director has to be vertical. And in between, it can do something complicated, right? It can vary continuously like that. Okay, so uh, the purpose of this slide is just to point out that um, there's you know, it's a continuous function of position, right? That position x is continuous, um, but in all the figures coming up, I'm going to draw the director on a limited set of points like this, okay? But I want to emphasize to you, you have to fill in the gaps with your mind, right? And that it really is continuous. This is not a lattice, okay? So, um, 
here we yeah we have n that is varying and it has constraints uh, on the two edges. I've drawn it as a double-headed arrow for the reasons that we've been talking about for the last two days, right? That the blue arrow represents a distribution of molecules which has equal populations pointing up or down along the arrow. Now, let's just look at some of the possibilities for what the configuration might be. Okay, so here in this top movie, right, here's a, a set of possibilities, right? So this is a whole continuous range of possibilities where the double-headed arrow is going continuously from X min to X max, and it always uh, satisfies the boundary condition, okay? Uh, here's another set of possibilities, right? Again, varying continuously as you, uh, as, as a function of time. Here's a third set of possibilities. Okay. So what you can see from these cartoons, right, is that um, within each set of configurations, right, you can continuously transform from one to another, right? And I am continuously transforming, right, as time goes on in the movie, right? But you can say, can you continuously transform from a configuration in set one to a configuration in set two, okay? Um, no, you cannot, right? So how can you tell that, right? Well, you can tell it because you can look at what's happening as you go from the left to the right, right? From X min to X max, okay? So in set number one, the, um, the director is going to have some changes as you go from the left to the right, okay? Here, I'll advance a little bit. The director makes some changes, right? It starts like this, and then it tips over, and then it tips back, right? And so there's no winding as you go from the left to the right, okay? By comparison, for set number two, right, as you go from left to right, you can see that the um, director is turning around like this, okay? It's rotating by half a circle as you go from the left to the right. It's rotating by half a circle in the counterclockwise direction as you go from the left to the right, okay? In set number three, as you go from left to right, the director rotates around by half a circle in the clockwise direction, okay? So when I make a continuous change, say in this set number two, let's pause that, stop. If I make a continuous change, it still is going through half a circle in the same counterclockwise direction, right? So if I count, how many times does the director rotate through a circle as you go from the left to the right, okay? In the top, I would say zero, right? For all the configurations in the top. For all the configurations in set two, I would say plus a half. For all the configurations in set three, I would say negative a half. Okay. So as you make continuous changes to the director field in the middle, this count is stuck at zero or plus a half or minus a half, right? There's no way I can make a continuous change and it'll be zero, 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 and then, whoops, no, it's something different, okay? The reason why it's stuck is the boundary conditions, right? That the boundary conditions are that the double-headed arrow has to be vertical, okay? And on this side, and it also has to be vertical on that side, okay? The only way that you can have it satisfy those boundary conditions is to rotate through uh, a half circle or a whole circle, right? Or some 
integer or half integer number of circles. Okay, So the count of rotations has to come out to be an integer or a half integer. Okay, um, So uh, that is a topological feature. Okay, something that's a count, not a measurement. Okay, Don't be hung up on the fact that it could be a half integer rather than an integer, right? I, I can count, but I'm just counting in halves instead of counting in, in units, right? But it's still a count, counting in halves instead of units. Okay. So the, um, whoops, how do I go forward here? Come on, come on, come on, come on. All right. So, to characterize the different sets of configurations, right? This is what I just told you, all right? So, we want to count the number of times that the director rotates through a full circle, right, on the way from x min to x max, okay? That's the winding number, right? I could characterize that by an integer by looking at the angle theta, right, the angle of the director relative to some reference, okay, and that angle has to rotate through pi radians, or in a multiple of pi radians, uh, hundred, multiple of 180 degrees, okay. So I can define the winding number as the um, the total change in theta, right? I'm measuring all the little increments of theta and adding them up as I go along from left to right, okay? And I'm considering the increments as positive or negative, right? A counterclockwise rotation is positive. A clockwise rotation is negative, okay? So if I add up all of these positive or negative variations of theta, it might be zero or pi or two pi or negative pi, right? And if I add them up and divide by two pi, I'm going to get an integer or a half integer, okay? So I could characterize that by this integral, right? The, the integral of d theta uh, divided by two pi, right? Or for people who want to write that as an integral over x, I could say it's the integral over x of d theta dx, right? Or if you don't want to work with theta at all, if you just want to work with the director n, then um, this combination of uh, you know, n cross dn dx dotted with z that's the same thing as d theta dx, right? If you just do a little bit of calculus with the n um, unit vector, right, this thing is the same as that, okay? So, um, you know, this quantity, I mean, it, it's a feature of the director field, um, and it may or may not be obvious that when you integrate it, it has to come out to be an integer or half an integer, but that is, in fact, the case. Okay, so I can categorize the different configurations based on what the integer or half integer comes out to be. All right, you good so far? Okay, so let's make it a little more complicated. Let's suppose that we have a 2D pneumatic and a 2D um, uh, position, right? So you have the unit vector as a function of not just x, but x and y, okay? There are lots of possible configurations. Let's think about this configuration, okay? So something that has this interesting feature with the red dot right there, okay? So I can do this winding config uh, number calculation for any path going from the left to the right, okay? So if I start with any path that goes um, below the red dot, okay? You can recognize that here the director is rotating through uh, pi radians um, uh, in a counterclockwise direction, right? Going from left to right. Okay, so the winding number here is coming out to be a half. Okay, um, it's still a half. It's still a half. 
It's still at half. Okay. Now, what happens if you go on the other side of the red dot? Whoops, it disappeared. Yikes, come on. Um, if you go on the other side of the red dot, like that, okay, well, it's not rotating, right? It, or it's rotating a little bit and going back in a case like this, okay? So the winding number is zero, right? So if I plot the winding number as a function of the y coordinate, the vertical coordinate, right? It's half, 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 then right at the red dot, it's undefined, and then it's zero, 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 zero. Okay, question. Yeah. Um, what if you took like the line that's right below the red dot and the line that's right above the red dot? Why uh, and tried to transform from that one to that one? It looks like you just need to change the arrows in the middle and like nudge them a little bit. Well, what matters is which side of the red dot you're on, right? And so for any path that goes below the red dot, you get a half, right? And it doesn't have to be a straight path, right? You can make a path that starts off like this and then it curves down and comes around like that and over there, right? But it's going below the red dot, and so you get a half, right? And for any path that, you know, starts here and then it goes above the red dot and comes around there, you get zero, right? So it's the red dot makes the difference, okay? And so, um, you know, we, I'm... I'm there's something about the red dot that's not continuous, right? When, when you transform from a path below the dot to a path above the dot, that's not a continuous transformation. That is making a big change. Does that answer your question or maybe not? Um, I'm a little confused because the path that's just below the red dot looks so similar to the path that's just above the red dot. No, not, not close to the dot. Right here, it's, it's curving around one way, and here it's curving around the other way. Can you say it loudly, please? When you take my direction and It's, it's continuous, right? So I was emphasizing this is not a lattice, right? And so um, you, you have to fill in all the gaps between these uh, sites with your mind, right? And so if you're going around this, this way, you can see that the um, uh, orientation is transforming in a counterclockwise direction, right? And if you go up here, you can see it's transforming in a clockwise direction. So it's a, it's a big difference between what happens above versus below the red dot. Uh -huh, question? I could, I cannot go continuously from something that has everything in the same direction to something that has this red dot in the middle. Yes, that, that is absolutely true. Um, I, I was going to kind of talk about that later, but yeah, yes, you're, you're, you're right. Uh -huh. I'm not sure if I quite got your question. Are you, are you happy now? You still don't look that happy. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so there's, there's something special about this red dot, right? And that, that changes the topological feature from anything below to anything above. All right. So let's, let's keep the same uh, director field. Oh, whoops, what did I do? Okay, let's keep the same director field, okay, and now I'm going to combine two paths, okay. So one path is this one that goes straight across 
and then it makes this little detour to go below the dot, and then it goes straight across. Okay, so that for sure has a winding number of a half plus a half. Okay, then I'll make a round trip. I'll come back uh, following this same backwards path, but I'll make a little detour above the red dot and then straight along. Okay, and so that path coming back has a winding number of zero. Um, it, act, it has a winding number of negative zero, right? Because I'm going backwards, but negative zero, zero. Okay, so um, I can say, what's the total winding number for this whole round trip? Okay, so it is plus a half on the way out and negative zero on the way back. So it adds up to plus a half for the round trip. Right? If I have, want to represent this with my finger, right? My finger starts off vertical, it comes around like this, it's pointing down, and now I come back, it comes around like this, and this, and this, and my finger's pointing down. Okay? So, uh, for the round trip, for this whole cycle, the winding number is a half. Now, I can simplify things a little bit. I could say, for this part of the uh, f first outward journey, and this part of the return journey, they just cancel each other, right? It's the same thing. So forget about those two. Okay. For this part of the outward journey, and this part of the return journey, they just cancel each other again. So I'll cancel those things out and say all that's left is the circle, the loop, going around the red dot. Okay. So I can say for a path that goes in a circle, in a loop, around the red dot, the total winding number is plus a half. Okay. And this works for any loop around the red dot, right? It doesn't have to be a little circle, it could be a big circle. It doesn't have to be a circle, right? It could be an ellipse or any funny shape, right? For any closed loop going around the red dot, right? I could say I start with my finger in one direction, I go around the loop, and my finger has rotated by 180 degrees, right? If I go around the loop in a counterclockwise direction, my finger has rotated by 180 degrees in a counterclockwise direction. Okay, you good with that so far? All right. So, now we make a kind of intellectual jump. Right? So instead of saying that the winding number characterizes the path going from left to right, we can say the winding number characterizes the red dot. Okay? So the red dot is a special feature such that whenever you go around it in a full loop, you get a winding number of plus a half. Okay? Unlike you know, any other place in the plane, if I make a loop somewhere else, and go around there, it's a winding number of zero. Okay. So that's a special feature of the red dot. Okay. That is what we mean by a topological defect. Okay. So the red dot is a topological defect in this director field. Okay. Um, otherwise known by different names in different contexts. So people would sometimes call it a disclination or an aster or a vortex, right? But it, it is a, a special point where the director is undefined, right? Um, right at that point. It's defined everywhere around the point and it has the feature that you have a certain winding number as you go about a loop around the point. 
And so this winding number can then be called a topological charge, right? By analogy with an electric charge, right? That the topological charge describes what's um, happening in any loop around the defect, okay? For the analogy with an electric charge, you can think of Gauss's law, right? So you know with an electric charge, right, if you make any Gaussian surface around an electric charge and you just make measurements about what's happening on the surface, you can figure out how much electric charge is enclosed, okay? Same idea here. Right, that if you make measurements on the loop going around a topological defect, you can figure out what's the defect charge that's enclosed. So, at this point, now we can forget about the boundary conditions, right? Everything that I worked hard to set up. Uh, Amanda, please. Um, the under, uh, oh, you mean considering that n and negative n are equivalent, right? Well, um, it, it, it doesn't matter here because, um, the quantity that I'm integrating is even in n, right? And so, um, for, for this purpose, um, you know, if I substitute negative n in place of n, I get the same result. You you have to be consistent, right? And so if you if you make a choice here, you have to make a consistent choice there, so that n is varying continuously as you go from there to there, right? Well, uh, you cannot make a continuous choice of n everywhere in this picture, right? Because when you go around this loop, right, you start off thinking that you're making one choice and then you go around the loop and you have a problem, right? And so um, um, that that is a problem for defining theta, right? That you can't define theta continuously, right? But, you know, even if you had um, uh, an arrow and not a double-headed arrow, right? And you went ar and you have a, a, a change of, of the full 360, right? As you go around, you can't define theta continuously, right? You could define the sign of the arrow everywhere in a consistent way, but you can't define theta in a consistent way, right? Because you would be going from, you know, zero degrees, one, two degrees, right? Around to 360 degrees, right? And so that, that would be a problem if you try to cover the whole plane, absolutely, right? But the thing that you're integrating uh, doesn't have to be expressed in terms of theta. It can be expressed as this even function of, of n, and so you can calculate it, right? If, if you only have, have n everywhere. Okay, good, good. Uh, let's see, where was I? So you can forget about the boundary conditions and just say now that you have a topological defect somewhere in the interior and look and see what sorts of topological defects you can find. Okay, so here are some examples, right? This is what I was showing you a minute ago with a topological charge of plus a half. And so if you move your finger around it, you can see your finger goes through a loop of um, 
uh, of 180 degrees in a counterclockwise way. Okay? This, by comparison, is a topological charge of negative a half. If you move your finger around that, you can see it rotates now by 180 degrees in a clockwise way, right, as you go around the loop. Okay. This is a picture which, uh, with a defect of charge plus one. Okay, so here, this is a more extreme defect. This is something where the director rotates through a full 360, two pi radians, as you go around the loop, rotating in a counterclockwise way. Sean, do we actually have a big wooden pointer here in this room? That would be useful for this illustration. I don't see one. All right, never mind, never mind. Um, okay, I'll just keep using my finger, fine. <laughs> um, okay, so this is, um, this is a plus one, okay? This is also a plus one, right? This is also a case where if you rotate around in a loop through a full, uh, uh, going around the loop, the finger moves in a full 360, two pi radians in a clockwise way, okay. um, in a counterclockwise way, excuse me. Um, so, so these two um, are, they look different from each other, but as far as the topological charge goes, they have the same topological charge, okay? This is a negative one, right? That if you move your finger uh, going around this loop, it goes around through a full circle, um, but in a clockwise sense, not a counterclockwise sense, right? So this is a negative one charge defect. Okay. So, um, another interesting analogy with, oh, question, please. If you go around the loop in a counterclockwise way, then the arrows rotate in a counterclockwise way. So it's consistent. The rotation of the arrows is the same direction as the way you're going around the loop, right? Whereas for the negative defect, uh, if you go around the loop in a counterclockwise way, then the, uh, then the arrows move in a clockwise way. Does that answer your question? Maybe not. I, I, I don't know if I could hear well enough. Did Oh, well, um, what can I use for a visual aid that's bigger? How about a Coke bottle? Ha, ha, ha. Screw it on tightly. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, what should we do? Like th this, this one, for example? Okay. So here, the Coke bottle is like this, okay? And as I rotate around, okay, this is making a counterclockwise rotation, right, as seen from you like that, okay? By comparison, if I do uh, this one in the corner, okay? Oh. But you know, this, this, this lecture is sponsored by the Coca-Cola Corporation, right? <laughs> um, okay, so uh, for, th thank you so much. Uh, okay, for, for this one, right, in this corner, right, as you go around the loop, it goes up this way, and then down, and then it goes down this way, and back there, right? That's a clockwise rotation as seen by you.
I, I, I can't hear well enough, I'm sorry. Oh, it's frozen in time, let's say, for this example. Frozen in time. So the only thing that's changing is where I'm looking, right? I'm looking at different points in a path going around the, the red dot. Okay? And so here, I have to point with the pointer. Okay? So I start, uh, let's say I start here. And the arrow's like that. Now I go up here. The arrow turns like that. Now I go down here. The arrow turns like that. Now I go down here. The arrow turns like that. Now I come around here. The arrow turns like that, right? So it's going through this rotation of um, 360 in the counterclockwise direction. Okay? All right. Sorry. Oh, another question, please. So, say for the uh, f, f, f equals plus one, if you were to start out at the uh, uh, very bottom, like, mm -hmm. where I between those two arrows going like this, which way would you go? Would you start with the uh, That's this one, right? Yeah, but you start at the very bottom. If I start at the very bottom, the director's like this, OK? Now I go around the loop to here. I think you need the very bottom of the picture. Yes. Here? What's the term is this direction? I'm always going around the red dot in this counterclockwise way. OK? And so if I go around in a counterclockwise way, then the director is rotating around like this, 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 this. This and down, down like that. Okay, and so um, uh, if I go in a counterclockwise, you know, march around the defect, then I get this counterclockwise rotation. Uh huh. Okay. Great. Great. Please. So here, if I start off at the bottom, it doesn't matter where I start, right? If I start at the bottom and I move up here, it's rotated like this, right? So that's a, a clockwise rotation. And now I go up here. I move like this. That's a clockwise rotation. And now I move like this. That's a clockwise rotation. And now I move down to the bottom. And that's a clockwise rotation. You mean if I, if I decide to go around loops in a clockwise direction? Oh, then everything switches, right? But I can see that in that picture. Oh, sure. Yeah. Here, in this one, for example? Yes, yes. If, I, if I decide to go around the loop in a clockwise direction, then the orientation is changing in a clockwise direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think in that case it matches. If you change right. the convention, it matches. it matches no matter what your convention is. So it's going to be plus one. Yeah. So this one is plus one. Yes. Oh, yeah, thank you. This is plus one, thank and you. this is also plus one, and that's minus one. Uh huh. It's minus one. So yes. Correct. Correct. Okay. Great. Great. What if you have two of these things? Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> if you have a plus half and a minus half here, okay. So. You can make a loop around the plus half, and you rotate through 180 degrees in a positive direction. If you make a loop around the minus half, 
you rotate through 180 degrees in the negative direction. What if you make a gigantic loop that goes around both of them? Okay. In that case, let, let's see. I'll do it with my yardstick. Okay, so starting over at the uh, right side. Okay, so I go, I tip it up like this and then back down. Okay, now I tip it down and back up. That's zero rotation, right? All the positive and negative rotations cancel. So the total topological charge enclosed inside the gigantic loop is zero. Okay? So the plus and the minus cancel each other, like with electrical charges, right? If you have a proton and an electron and you make a big Gaussian surface around both of them, you get a total flux of zero. Okay. In this picture, we have a plus half on the left and another plus half on the right. Okay. If you make a great big loop, then the orientation goes up like this, gets to be vertical, it comes down. Okay. Now it goes down, around like that, horizontal. Okay. That's a full rotation by 360 degrees. So the plus half and the plus half combine to make plus one. Okay. So it works like electrical charges in that sense. For this specific model, when I get to more complicated things, it won't necessarily add like that. But for this specific model, it does add like that. Okay. Question? If you, you mean if you had one defect up high and one down low? Yeah, or, or on the same axis, but instead of being pi by 2, it's pi by 2 plus some number. Right. Like the number of I think what you're remarking on is that these defects have orientational features, right? So apart from the topological charge, they also, you know, look sort of like comets where they have a head and then a tail sticking out. And you can ask about how the orientation changes or, or, or what are the orientational features of the, of the defect. Um, that's actually a subject that I love. I, I love this question. Mwah! Right. But, um, but uh, that's, that's a subject I'm not going to talk about here. That's a separate sort of complicated thing. But, you know, the, the short answer to your question is, you know, the, the counting of the total charge would stay the same. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. All right. Let's go back to one dimension now. Okay. So I, I showed you that um, this kind of feature right here, right, is characterized by a, a winding number, right, of a half. Okay. And in general, you know, in this picture, it's, it's spread out, right? So the winding is spread out all the way from x min to x max, okay? But let's suppose for some reason that it became more concentrated, something like that, okay? So it's the same winding from the left to the right, but... It's not a spread out winding. I've gradually pushed the winding to be all in one place. Okay. So I still get an interesting feature, but this is something different from a topological defect, right? There's no red dot here. There's no uh, loop going around anywhere. This is some concentrated winding. Okay. This is another kind of topological object, which is different from the object that I showed you before. What to call it, right? It's a feature characterized by this winding number. Uh, we could call it a wall, right? We could say this is a wall uh, where as you go across the wall, say from left to right, that the orientation 
rotates through pi radians. Okay? Uh, we can call it a wall or a pi wall because it's changing by pi. Um, um, people could call it a topological soliton or structure or a topological texture. Right? These are other words that are out there in the literature. I'm going to use the word soliton in this, uh, in this presentation. Okay. Now, as you look in the literature, you will occasionally find papers that refer to this thing as a defect. Okay. You may be confused because you may think this is different from the defects that you saw on the previous slides, like this. Okay. Um, I they might call it, someone might call it a defect, someone might call it a non-singular topological defect. Okay. I, I do not love this terminology, but I recognize that it exists. You should be prepared for it. Okay. But whatever you call it, it is a different thing than the defects that I showed you on the previous slides. Okay. So I'll call it a soliton for now. Okay. Whoops, where am I? Okay, so let's compare the topological defects versus solitons. Okay. You can see the topological defect, right, it's a point-like object in two dimensions, right there. The topological soliton is a point-like object in one dimension, okay? Here, there's a singular point where the director is undefined. Here, there isn't. The director is perfectly well defined everywhere as you go along this.
That is, if you have one defect. Okay. What if you have two defects, like the pictures that I showed you, right, with the gigantic loop enclosing two defects? Okay. In that case, the solution of the Euler-Lagrange equation is uh, a sum of inverse tangents. Oops, typographical error. These are arc tangents, not tangents. Sorry about that. Okay, so it's uh, S1 times one arc tangent plus S2 times another arc tangent uh, plus a constant. Okay, if I uh, work out the free energy by calculating the gradient of this thing and integrating it over the whole system with some approximations that I don't have time to talk about, um, I get one term that involves the first defect, one term that involves the second defect, and then an interaction free energy. Some extra free energy which involves the log of the distance between the two defects. The derivative of that free energy makes a force between the defects, right? So you'll notice I've got a free energy which is an integral over all space, right? It's not a property specifically of those points. But the integral over all space depends on the distance between the two defects. If that distance changes, the free energy changes, that makes a force which tends to push the defects apart or pull them together. Okay? It is attractive for opposite signs and repulsive for uh, like signs. So it is like Coulomb's law for electrical charges in that sense. Okay. A uh, question. So you're saying that uh, uh, the, the defects are necessarily pinned in, in, in space where you have them in that image? Like if, if, you, if you have two defects, they interact with each other and then they don't start to So then they start to move. Yes, that, that's right. And so if you have opposite charges, they can move together and annihilate each other, like uh, an electron and a positron. Right? And if you have two uh, uh, positive charges, then they'll repel and they'll, they'll move apart from each other. Yes. And the, the force is proportional to 1 over r. It's not a force like 1 over r squared. Okay. So it's not like Coulomb's law in our three-dimensional universe, okay? But if you work out Coulomb's law in a two-dimensional universe, that would be this 1 over r dependence. So it's like Coulomb's law in the 2D universe. So this has to do with the, the free energy of defects, okay? What about for solitons? Okay. For solitons, um, here I need to add a special feature. I need to add some kind of magnetic field or electric field, something which makes an anisotropy so that the director tends to align in some direction. Okay. Um, then the free energy is going to be the combination of the elastic free energy plus the um, magnetic free energy, like what I was showing you for the Frederick's transition yesterday. Okay. I can make the Euler-Lagrange equation for this combination of terms. Okay. This then becomes a nonlinear differential equation, as somebody was asking about a minute ago. Okay. The solution of this nonlinear differential equation uh, has this mathematical form with a characteristic length scale like that magnetic coherence length that I was talking about yesterday. Okay. And a plot of the solution looks like this. Okay. So you can see that the um, orientation is locked in pretty close to negative pi over 2 over a great big region over here. And then inside some 
narrow region of size psi, it flips from being um, uh, negative pi over 2 to being pi over 2. Okay, it's, it's still continuous, it's just increasing pretty rapidly from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And then it's pretty close to pi over 2 everywhere out there, going off to infinity. Okay. So this is a soliton, right? It's a soliton with some finite width, psi. And that width requires the combination of an elastic free energy and the anisotropy, the applied magnetic field. Right? If you didn't have the anisotropy, then everything would just get spread out over a great big distance. So it gives this characteristic width, and it gives a free energy for the soliton. Okay. What if there were two solitons? Right? Well, you can't solve this exactly. Right? It's a nonlinear differential equation that can't be solved exactly. If I try to make some hand-waving approximation, I could say, if the solitons are pretty far apart, a lot farther apart than the width of each soliton, then you can approximately add the solutions. And then you get a free energy, which is the free energy of each individual soliton, plus an extra interaction term. And the interaction term decays exponentially with the length scale psi. Okay? So this makes an interaction between solitons, which is a short range interaction. So this is a way of seeing that solitons are short range features, right, with a characteristic length scale of psi, whereas the topological defects are long-range, spread-out features where the free energy diverges with the system size and the interaction decays only as 1 over r, a force of 1 over r, which is a pretty slow decay compared to an exponential. Question, please. It's emerging from the interaction of the, of the whole director field. That's right. Both for solitons and for defects. That, that, that's right. That's right. So we have a free energy, which is the free energy of everything, uh, but it depends on what's the separation between these topological features. And so we can interpret this whole integrated free energy as an interaction. Mm -hmm. But if they are not present, in that case, do we expect a force between any two points or something? So if we differentiate the free energy expression where there is no soliton or defect present, do we get any relation in that? Well, it depends. What are you differentiating with respect to? Right. Like any two points. No, no. Um, I mean, it's a free energy that's been integrated over all of the position, right? But you know, if you have uh, walls, for example, right, and you differentiate with respect to the separation between the walls, right, that might be a free energy, you know, that makes the walls be attracted together or repelled apart, right? Um, and, and this kind of thing happens in lots of areas of physics, right, where you have the free energy or just the energy of a field defined everywhere that depends on a couple of features and um, and then the integrated energy might draw the features together or push them apart like for the the Casimir effect in in quantum electrodynamics right you have the free energy associated with the uh, electric field right and that draws the walls together mm -hmm. Okay, where am I here? All right, all right, so that's the story for a two-dimensional pneumatic.
okay, in one dimension or two dimensions. Now, we can have lots of generalizations of that. Okay, so Schwang, I'm about half finished now with this talk. Is this, it's seven minutes for the second half. Okay, let's see what generalizations I can do. All right, one kind of generalization is for what's the dimension of space, okay? Um, so I can now say, what if you still have a 2D unit vector, but it's defined as a function of three dimensions, x, y, and z, okay? And the measuring surface, the path that you do measurements on, is still one-dimensional. Well, in that case, uh, everything gets extended, okay? So for topological defects, you could have the defect points get extended to make defect lines like this, okay? And the defect lines still have the topological feature that if you draw any loop that encloses a line, uh, you get a non-zero winding number. And if you draw any loop that doesn't enclose a line somewhere over here, then you get zero winding number, okay? The lines could be straight, or maybe they'll be curved, like this. Or maybe there'll be a whole closed loop, like that, okay? And so people who study three-dimensional pneumatic liquid crystals see features like this, right? That pneumatic liquid crystals have defect lines in them. Um, Solitons get extended also. This was a question a little while ago, right? And so if you extend a soliton from uh, 1D to 2D, then the wall becomes a wall like this, or maybe it could be curved, or maybe it could be closed in a loop like that. It, question, question, please. Is that obvious? Well, well, um, you could ask, you know, what happens to your green loop, right? So suppose you have a red line that's coming up, 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 and then it stops, okay? If I draw the green loop around the red line, uh, I get plus half. Another green loop, I get plus half. Up here, the green loop has to get zero, okay? So how do you get from there to there, right? You know, that, that has to do with how the winding number needs to be continuous and it's locked in as an integer or half integer, right? And so, you know, how would you get from having it being half to being zero up there? Right, I, I, I think that's the, the topological consideration that keeps it from terminating so in the middle. You can make a loop of red line that closes on itself, okay. right? So that's that's what this is okay. meant to be, oh, right? You can you can pull the two points away from the the edge, okay. right? Yes, you can make a loop that goes around the whole double red line, right? And that adds up to zero. And then, you know, right, so if with a gigantic loop, you get zero here, and you also get zero up there, right? So you absolutely can have a loop, and that definitely does happen in 3D pneumatic crystals, right? So it's, it's terminating a line can't happen, but a gigantic loop can happen, yes. So, you know, a, a rule would be that the dimension of the defect would be the dimension of space minus the dimension of the measuring surface, which here is one, uh, minus one, okay? Whereas the dimension of the soliton is the dimension of space minus the dimension of the measuring surface. So it's a different dimension, right? And so, you know, in 2D, for example, uh, 
the defects have dimension 0 and the solitons have dimension 1. OK. And the last thing here, maybe I can do one more thing before uh, Schwang uh, gets a hook and drugs me off. Um, um, there can be different kinds of order parameters. Okay. For a 2D pneumatic, that's what I told you about so far. Okay. For a 2D polar phase, so that's a phase that's characterized by arrows with a single head, not arrows with a double head. Okay. That's actually basically the same story as I told you before, except that you can't go around a half circle when you go around a loop. You have to go around a whole circle to get back to where you started. So the defects have to be integers, not half integers. Okay? So it's a more restricted set than I had before, but still basically the same story. However, if you have a 3D phase, then 3D meaning that N can be in 3D, not just that R can be in 3D, but N can be anywhere in 3D, then the behavior gets more complicated. Okay, In 3D, with a polar phase, with single-headed arrows like this, okay, you may think you've got a defect of charge plus one right there. But wait, what can happen to it? It sneaks up like that. Oops, the defect's gone, right? People say it escaped into the third dimension, okay? Same with a negative one defect. Whoops, wrong movie. Come on, this movie. You, think, you thought you had a defect of negative 1 here. But if the, if the arrows are free to align in, uh, uh, in Z as well as X and Y, then, yep, they can escape again. You can continuously transform something with a defect into something with no defect. So a 3D polar phase doesn't actually have these defects. What about a 3D pneumatic phase? Here it's even trickier, right? For a 3D pneumatic phase, the integer charge defects could escape into the third dimension. But what about half integer charge defect? Here, if you rotate things in the third dimension, Right here, I'm starting with something that looks like a negative half, right? You see that looks like a negative half. That's the same picture I was showing you before. Now, I let things rotate in the third dimension. And what happened? Come on. And they rotate around like that and come on down. And look, it's a plus half, right? So. With the topology of a three-dimensional pneumatic, not polar, phase, you can continuously transform between a plus half and a minus half. Right? So instead of saying there are separate topological groups, of, uh, topological classifications of 0, plus half, plus 1, plus 3 halves, et cetera, right? Instead, there, any integer is equivalent to nothing. And any half integer is equivalent to any other half integer. So you either have nothing or you have a half integer defect. And that is what is observed in 3D pneumatic liquid crystals. You see half integer defects. And there's no topological statement of are they plus half integer or minus half integer? Because you could gradually change one form into the other form. So it is just abstract, half integer, plus or minus, right? Versus nothing. 
I think I'm pushing against the limits of my time, and I kind of got to stop here. Did I have anything else? Oh, I have a lot more about the dimension of the measuring surface, but uh, too bad. I got to skip that. All right. Thank you, guys. Please. No, it is not zero. It is a twisted structure in the third dimension, right? So that if I represent it by, you know, going around in a loop like this, okay, then I'm going around out of the plane. So instead, I'm now going to rotate around this way out of the plane. And so I get a twisted three-dimensional structure. And that is how I go between plus a half and minus a half. I'm going to trust you on that. <laughs> well, no, that's what the picture was showing here. Look, if I, if I look at the picture, Schwang, he's the reason I'm going over time. Uh, OK. If I, if I stop the movie halfway through, right, that's what this is showing. Right? So this is a, a twisted structure, okay? where when I go in my, in my loop, right? I've got a loop in the xy plane, as I go around the loop, the cylinders are rotating out of the plane. Right? So it's not that the cylinders are going clockwise or counterclockwise through a half circle. They're going out of plane through a half circle. And, but they're still going through half a circle, right? And so that's the, the twisted intermediate state. Please. Everything in between will be twisted, yes. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's maximally twisted right in the middle. Right. Everyone can go get coffee, but I'll just answer questions right here. I have a right point here. to get coffee. A couple quick announcements. Um, it's great, though, that you get so many questions. Um, <laughs> so first of all, we really could use some more drivers for the hike today. The weather's supposed to clear up and get nice, they say. Um, if you can possibly drive, uh, talk to Menon outside there. If you can't, if you don't have enough drivers, we'll just do a few back and forth trips. It's only a 10 minute drive. So. Second thing is, we want to get a group picture of our 2023 summer school. So the very first thing we're going to do when we go outside here is to go up on the stairs so we can take a group picture. Okay? Mm -hmm. Good. It's great how much interaction you're getting. Yeah, <laughs> really? yeah that's, that's really unusual. Yes. Yeah. Send the slides to, or you, you will oh, send sure. the slides to us. Sure, whatever you like. Okay, okay. I just have a quick question. You mentioned when you have uh, opposite.